So we're going to look at alkynes and this, this is the third member if you like as we've walked for third, third family of compounds that we're going to look at and the alkynes are um, the alkynes are an interesting one in that they have a carbon-carbon triple bond. So if you were to think about how we've been moving through these uh, organic families if you like First of all, we started off with the alkanes, so that would be perhaps if we just take the simplest one there, methane, and that's carbon bonded to four individual hy hydrogens. That's a hydrocarbon because there's hydrogen and carbon in it, and as you see, the carbon is bonded to four different atoms. So every carbon in this molecule is bonded to four different atoms. Therefore, it is considered to be saturated, remember. And the second mem member in that family, and I'll draw that one just for ease of comparison of the other ones. And there you have ethane, you see. So you have methane, and then you have ethane. That's the two of those. And they are the alkanes. So remember, one carbon is meth, two carbons is F, E, T, H, uh, and these all end in A, N, E, because they are, of course, the alkenes. And then we looked at the alkenes. Now, what makes an alkene an alkene, or what, what's its functional group, or what makes it distinctive, is a carbon-carbon double bond. So you can imagine, you can't have one member in that family, it's two, it has to be two. For the, for the simple reason that obviously you need to have a carbon-carbon double bond. Now you'd be surprised the amount of people that write methene, but there's no such thing. Ethene is the first member. Now think about that. I, I hope it's relatively obvious, but you know, like the smallest number of carbons possible in, in, in a, an alkene is two because you need a double bond between two carbons. So if you like, it doesn't have a meth member. It's the first member. Oh, I made an error there. We'll have to take away the um, there's just two car two hydrogens off that one of course. Uh, see if I can get oh. eraser. Oh, yeah. So there's two and normally what you would do is you would um when you're drawing those, uh, when you're drawing the alkenes, normally what you do is you put the double bond like so, and then you would put them out at an angle to adhere to the Visper model. So that would be the first member of the alkenes. And if you were to look at it, this is what it looks like. You see, and remember the geometry about these. They're, that's considered to be a planar carbon there because the three atoms that it's bonded to, this other carbon and these two hydrogens, one and two, the three of those around this central carbon are all on the same plane. If you put a page down, they'd all, the page would cut them all in the middle. So that's considered to be a planar carbon and that's considered to be a planar carbon. Both of them are individually planar carbons because the three atoms that they're bonded to are in the same plane as itself. And that's considered to be a alkene. And then you also have the member that is, there's the first member of the, there's the first member of the, or second member, my apologies, second member of the alkanes. So that's ethane and that's ethene. You see? Now those carbons and ethane are tetrahedral. Remember that, that they're all off and four different. But remember, the, the family of compounds we want to look at today has actually has a triple bond between the two carbons. 
So you see there, that's a planar carbon because that carbon that's attached to and that carbon that is bonded to, or that hydrogen, sorry, that's bonded to, are in the same plane as itself. And likewise here, that hydrogen and that carbon are in the same plane as that one there. So that's considered to be ethane. So the difference here is you have a carbon triple bonded to another carbon. So again, the minimum number of carbons you could have in an alkyne is two. And then you have a bond to a hydrogen to, to fill up all the bonds in both carbons. You see it still gets the four bonds, but this time three of those bonds are to another carbon. And likewise, for the second carbon, it's the same thing. And that's the uh, alkynes. And the interesting thing about the alkynes is this triple bond. Now again, I showed you this with a double bond. You know, if, if you were to, if I was to put one carbon here and one carbon here, and then to sh rather than showing the atoms like circles and Bohr mo model, or electrons I should say, what we'll do is we'll show the orbitals. So you remember that they're in a dumbbell shape like that. And they overlap like so. You see? They overlap, the orbitals overlap, and then you could put the two electrons into it, and that would be the first bond. And remember that first bond is considered to be a sigma bond, written as sigma. And then if you were to create a, a double bond, that means another two electrons must be shared between the two carbons, just like what you learned from junior cert, then you need to over, side on overlap two orbitals. So like in junior cert, you, you drew two circles like so, and you put electrons in here. You see, we've moved on from that now. You put four electrons in there to show a double bond and one atom here, one atom here. And then you'd show the inside shells as well and put the electrons on those. Uh, but we're not gonna, you know, when you move on, you can, in terms of orbitals now, we want to we want to discuss it. Now really for leaving cert, the main thing that you need to know is that the double bond is made out of a sigma bond which is head-on overlapping of P orbitals. Remember those dumbbells are the P orbitals. If you look up carbon's uh, electron configuration, it, it's, it's, it's valence suborbital, if you like, or where, where it has uh, room to share electrons is in the P orbital, the 2P. So you get this double bond that's made out of one very strong bond. Now you need to think about why that bond is strong. Because those electrons are directly between the two nuclei that are pulling on it. They're directly between, and you need to think about that. Those electrons there are directly between that carbon and that carbon. So they have a very strong pulling. Those electrons will be pulled equally by both carbons, and they're, they're as close as they can be to the nucleus of those carbons, which is of course what pulls on them, the positively charged protons. Whereas up here, you would have the pi, bond and the pi bond you see those electrons are not directly between they're above it you need to ask yourself why are they above it as well and they're above it quite simply because this these two electrons repel these two electrons forcing those ones upwards because they were here first if you like you can think of it like this therefore that's a pi bond and it's relatively well it's, re it's weaker I should say than this sigma bond because the orbitals only side-on overlap rather than head-on. Um, we mentioned bits about that before, but just to, to emphasize at this point. And then now to go on to the alkynes, you see, the, the only really thing I need you to take from this is that you'll always have a sigma bond, first of all. So there's one carbon again and one carbon, and there's the two electrons in there. That's one Bond. The next bond will be the same as the one above, side on overlapping of p orbitals, and then the last one will be side on overlapping of p orbitals once again, and there you have it. You see? So now you have again one sigma bond, one pi bond, and another pi bond. So triple bonds are made out of a sigma bond and two pi bonds. Simply put, what a, what a sigma bond is, is when the, the orbitals head-on overlap, like this. 
a pi bond is when you are ready, I, I can't not draw because there's no reason they would side on overlap unless, so I must draw that one first, so that's the sigma bond, we're not going to talk about it in this diagram. The side on overlapping, you see, the best that can be achieved after a sigma bond. And that's that. And then you could have another one as well. And that's essentially how they, uh, that's the family there that we're going to look at, the alkynes. The naming system and this naming hopefully gets somewhat arbitrary for you after a while and that you, you know, F is 2 and you remember it has to be 2 to have a double bond between 2 carbons. Prop is 3, but is 4 uh, and there's but again. The triple bond, instead of it being on the first carbon, it's on the second carbon. Remember, I know it's between the second and the third depending on what way you're numbering it. But we always number them based on where the double bond starts. And I always keep the number as low as possible. So that basically means keep it as close as possible to the side of the molecule or the end of the molecule. That means that its number as low as possible. Obviously, if the triple bond was over here, it'd be the same molecule as that just flipped around. So it'd be, it'd be but. It's not that it's a different molecule, it's just flipped around. And you need to think about that. But those two are different, remember. Uh, and there we have a triple bond consists of a pi bond, the, the head on overlapping if you like of uh, orbitals, p orbitals in this case and then the two pi bonds either side of it and that's, they're the alkynes. Alkynes we don't go into quite as much um, I mean if you knew those four you would probably be uh, you would be as far as it's going to go and leave insert. The alkynes are a hydrocarbon, remember made, made out of hydrogen and carbon with at least one carbon is a triple bond carbon to carbon triple bond name of the alkyne is exactly the same, the only difference ends in Y-N-E. Uh, being compounds of low or zero polarity, that means, you know, they're, they're effectively, if you look up the electronegativities of each of these, the carbons and the hydrogens, which I'm sure you're well familiar with this at this point, uh, they have, they have no polar, there's, like it's, they're all pretty fair sharing bonds. That means that no atom has any permanent pulling power over the electrons over any other. So you don't have a permanent positive end, permanent negative end. But remember we went into a lot of detail that electrons do slosh over and back. Uh, just like water in a bottle sloshing over and back if you like. Uh, so you can get temporary dipoles where electrons end up at one end of the molecule um, for a split second and then slosh back over to the other side again. Um, so they're very, that's, that determines them as well. They're not that different to alkenes and alkenes for that reason. They have low solubility in water because remember water molecules are all sticking together. We looked at that in another, molecule, another uh, video as well. Never forget that chemistry of water. Water molecules cling together quite simply because they um, the, the oxygens in water are slightly positive, the hydrogens in water are slightly, sorry my apologies, the oxygens are slightly negative and the hydrogens are slightly positive and they cling together because of the fact that you have a, part, a permanent partial negative end, a permanent partial positive end and then they hold together and it's not that the, you know, the, the uh, hydrocarbons don't want to get in between them it's that they can't. So there's two water molecules you see them clinging together the blue here being the oxygen and slightly negative because of electronegativity difference remember oxygen in this particular water molecule pulls on the electrons away from both these hydrogens more than they can pull on it giving it this, the oxygen a slightly negative charge so that's within that molecule permanently slightly negative oxygen and slightly positive hydrogens. But then if you bring them together you say two molecules this is what you will have. You will have that attraction because slightly negative will be attracted to slightly positive, a neighboring molecule. And remember the bonds within the molecule are in tra bonds but the bonds between molecules, what we're talking about here, dipole dipole attraction is remember. Dipole meaning two ends, positive end and negative end within one molecule and then you have the dipole-dipole attraction 
where that positive end of that water molecule is attracted to that negative end of that water molecule and vice versa the other parts. And that forms a very strong bond and that's a special type of dipole-dipole attraction known as hydrogen bonding. So you can think about that, it's hydrogen bonding because of the fact that hydrogen acts as a bridge between this oxygen, which is very electronegative, and this oxygen. So like hydrogen bonding is just a special type of dipole-dipole attraction. But if you bring a hydrocarbon like ethane, the family we're looking at in this video, see it can't get in between it. It doesn't have a negative end or a positive end to be attracted to either the hydrogens here or the oxygens. So it sits on top. I'm less worried about the density question here. What I'm more worried about is why don't they mix in the first place? And that is because this is non-polar. It doesn't have a dipole. It doesn't have a permanent dipole. Whereas these have a permanent dipole. Now if you had a load of these together and you drop the temperature, you can liquefy ethane. Now the old name for ethane was acetylene. It's used in the welding kits. So acetylene is the, the non-IUPAC name for it. But if you had a load of these together, remember that electrons slosh over and back, over and back, over and back. So if you had another one of them here, let's say this is another one of them, then y you can have a partial, as electrons slosh over here for a split second, given this a partially negative end, they actually force the electrons in the neighboring molecule to go the other way, but they'll flip over and back, over and back, almost like the flash dance, which we talked about before. So they're going over and back, over and back, over and back. So they can hold as a liquid themselves uh, if you drop the temperature sufficiently low. Now the lower members are gases because you have to drop the temperature. STP, remember, is zero degrees Celsius. So they're still gas. When I say the lower members, I'm talking about ethane and propane, you know, the lower members. But then as you go up, because there's more electrons to slosh over and back. Remember, big, big molecules. When you have more electrons sloshing over and back, then you can get a stronger temporary negative end and temporary positive end. Temporary because they keep flipping over and back, over and back, don't forget that. Uh, but we have talked about that now a few times. Uh, but just th like those trends are always, it's not like those trends are going to change. Increase in length and carbon chain, you are going to have an increase in the boiling point. Like that's, there's no doubt about that. Because you have more electrons sloshing over and back, you have a stronger dipole. You just need to think about that. Um, and look at, there's the members. The general trend, and that's all three families that we looked at, the alkanes, the alkenes, and alkynes. Now, alkenes are interesting because they have this large, um, they have this large area of electron density, huge electron density, the triple bond there, remember. So that is an effect on their chemistry to a greater degree. Um, what was that last one there? Oh well, yeah, the geometry as well, remember that they're planar. Like if you were to pick this carbon, those two atoms to which it is bonded are in the same plane as it. If you put a page there, they would be in the same plane. It's as simple as that. Um, and then likewise, this carbon, those two are in the same plane as that carbon. So the both of them are planar carbons. The planar carbons individually, of course. Um, and that's, like sometimes we'll even say people just say that uh, a planar carbon is one involved in a double bond or a triple bond, but I think you should really think about it so that, you know, you're not just learning words off. Um, and when you come back next year, you know, we can talk more about that, but in any case, uh, this is the situation we have now. Uh, preparation of ethane, there is calcium carb dicarbide. Now that's a, an unusual one, dicarbide. What that is essentially is CCA2. It's a, it's a, a sort of a brown uh, or a gray, I should say, gray whitey solid. It comes in like little chips. Um, it's a huge problem with it, of course. It comes in contact with water. You see there's such a simple reactant for this experiment. When you put the water uh, on top of the calcium dicarbide, 
it will give off a lot of um, impurity. It's quite impure. So a lot of impurities, sulfur containing compounds will be given off as gases if you like. So the purpose of this acidified copper sulfate is to take out the impurities. Now that's a blue substance. Again, uh, you can look at the video on this. I'll send you a link to a video of this experiment maybe and that would be the best way to do it. And then going forward then you go across uh, that's just a normal um, downward displacement of water, you know, the gas is produced here, uh, the pressure builds up so it has to be forced over, it's forced through the copper sulphate, acidified copper sulphate to take out impurities uh, and then you have a delivery tube into a test tube with ethane and then you can carry out some tests in it. Uh, if you put it into bromine water, I'll give you a link to that experiment in any case, but like if you put it onto bromine water again, uh, bromine water will will break. I went into a lot of detail in that with the L more than was necessary actually at this point. But uh, if you remember, oh, why is that pen? Um, if you remember that, that when you have a triple bond like that and you put it in the presence of uh, you put it in the presence of bromine. I won't go into the more detailed explanation. You 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 will do that next year, but I, I showed you in one other videos. There's BR, BR, uh, and that effectively will go down and break that pi bond and connect on to be, give you a BR here, and then eventually the other BR will will go on as well, and you get that that structure and that bond will be gone. You see. But in any case, what I'm saying is this is an orange color and when you add ethane to it, uh, it will decolorize. Uh, the other experiment, your little test you can do with it is you can um, put a, a lit splint into it and you get a very sooty flame. In any case, I won't go into any more detail because I'll show you the uh, video specific to that. Uh, that's the experiment there. You see it's an unusual one, CaC2 um, calcium dicarbide. Dar dicarbide being two carbons, calcium dicarbide. Um, ethane can be prepared in that reaction. It's a colorless gas, it has a pleasant odor. Um, you find that with the alkynes. And the combustion, ethane burns with a smoky luminous flame. The lot of soot is generated because of all the, on the carbon. You see, there's a very high percentage of carbon in that molecule. Like, there's, there's two carbons and only two hydrogens. If you thought of an alkene, there would be two, uh, two carbons and four hydrogens. If you think of an alkane, you have two carbons and you have six hydrogens. So you see, there's a lot of carbon here for the number of hydrogens compared to the other two families. And when you burn, you get a sooty flame. The sooty flame comes from the carbon. Um, and I've said that already, it decolorizes bromine because, yeah, I don't worry too much about the complicated products, but you should know that it breaks the pi bond. I don't see any, a problem with that. And then it's also oxidized as well by acidified potassium and manganate. Uh, so acidified potassium and manganate is, is sort of a pinky purple color first. And when it comes in contact, again, there's an oxidation reaction that occurs there. Look at it, it'll make more sense when uh, we look at oxidation and reduction. So I'll leave that one. But essentially it, it changes from a sort of a, a pinky color to a colorless color uh, if it's acidified potassium and manganate. The acidified part is actually important there. Uh, and that guys brings us to the end of the families. So we looked at the alkanes first, then the alkenes, then the alkynes. Single carbon carbon bonds are of course the first, first member of this just has one carbon in it that is of course methane that's the gas that comes into the laboratory for experiments and that um, and then you have the alkenes and then you have the alkynes and then we, we haven't talked much about our aromatics so we won't worry about that today but that guys essentially brings us to the end of the main hydrocarbons that we look at and leave inside chemistry.